always pleased to see uh, Mayor White here. He's a longtime supporter of Houston's history, and it's it's good to to recall one of our one of our shining moments as a city, which is the 10th anniversary of the Katrina relief effort. It's pretty amazing when we look back on it what our city did in a moment of crisis for real life human beings who were looking for help and not finding it almost anywhere else other than Houston. So um, we're housed in the Center for Public History. Martin Melosi is the director for 30 years and the creator and builder of the Center for Public History. And this is the first in what we hope will become a series entitled Historically Speaking. The title is roughly, well it is the same as the fifth anniversary issue we put out, uh, Houston's Helping Hand Remembering Katrina. Um, fifth Anniversary Magazine was the brainchild of a fine old colleague named Ernesto Valdez, who's now no longer with us. He did a lot of the interviews and died before the um, magazine came out. So in a way, this is a celebration of his life also. Um, we Texans boast and Houstonians boast of our friendliness and our can-do spirit. We sound like that's a Texas brag most of the time. In this case, it isn't. Uh, above all, there was compassion on the streets of Houston, which was in short supply in other places for people who, whose lives had been really um, torn apart by Katrina. Um, personally, I've, I've, I've lived in Houston all but 10 years of my life. I think that's the proudest moment I've ever had as Houstonian. And not just the leaders who were strong and good and gave good direction, but Houstonians of all walks of life uh, got together and did whatever we could to help people who obviously needed help. Um, I'm proud of the magazine. I'm proud of being able to be a part of things like this. Have uh, Betty Stead, others who help us with the magazine for a long time. Uh, students here, where the, where's the staff? Stand up and expose yourself. Yeah, here we go. We, we have a course called Houston History now, and a lot of our, uh, the students in the, in the course are become interns. Uh, we have graduate students uh, who are also helping, so uh, we're, we're really um, doing a good job, I think, attracting young people to the study of Houston history and helping them learn how to do it. I'm Debbie Harwell. I'm the managing editor of the ah, magazine. Well and we're, we're very pleased to be a community partner with the Harris County Library System's Gulf Coast Reads program. Uh, each year they have a committee that selects a book with a Texas connection. And it's enjoyed by readers all across our region, not just in Harris County. And then libraries and partners like us hold events in October to coordinate with the topics that are in the book. Uh, this year they're holding more than 100 events uh, related to Ann Weisgarber's book, The Promise, which is set in Galveston during the 1900 storm, hence our hurricane panel. Uh, Ann earned her master's degree here at the University of Houston in sociology. She taught at Wharton County Junior College and Alvin Community College before becoming a full-time award-winning author. Uh, this is her second novel, and I can tell you that as a historian, my first impression when I read it was, wow, this woman really did her homework. And then it wasn't very long after that that as a reader I realized she had totally hooked me in. So. Uh, on that note, I'm very happy to introduce to you Anne Weisgarber. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Pratt, for the wonderful introduction for the panel. And also thank you, um, Debbie, um, for the introduction as well. Debbie is the person, from what I understand, um, spearheaded this panel. And I think it's pretty remarkable that she managed to get all these people together at one time and one place. So well done, um, Debbie. Um, most of all, my thanks go to all of you for being here today. Everybody lives such busy lives, but here you are. And um, thank you so much. And um, while I have the microphone, I've got to say it, go Astros. Right. <laughs> They're going to win. Um, as, as Debbie said, um, the promise does take place on um, Galveston Island outside of the city limits in, in an area that in 1900 was called Down the Island. And the story begins about two weeks before the 1900 storm, which was the worst natural disaster in the United States in terms of deaths. The numbers range um, anywhere from 6,000 to 8,000 to 10,000 um, people who died on a single day, September 8th. 1900. It's hard to imagine such a loss. There were about a thousand people on the mainland who died on that day as well, and there were also people who died 
following the storm from wounds, from step, stepping on rusty nails, um, from the cleanup, um, and from rattlesnake bites. Uh, not that that has anything to do with my book. Um, <laughs> But um, when I started the, started the idea for the book, I realized that very little has been written about the 1900 storm um, outside of the city limits. Everything that we read focuses on the East End and the business district. In 1900, um, the, the, um, the down the island outside of the city limits was about 43rd Street, if you know where Broadway is. 43rd Street is where the big cemetery, city cemetery, is today. Anything past that in 1900 was called down the island and was outside of the, the city limits. And I, I figured there had to have been people who lived there, even though their stories have not been told. So as a good researcher, I went, of course, to the only place you can go, and that's the Rosenberg Library in Galveston. And I went to the special collections at the Galveston and Tex Texas History Room. And I asked the head archivist, Casey Green, I said, were people on down the island in 1900? And he had never been asked that question before. So hot on the trail, he went back into the archives and he found a directory. And the citizens of Galveston had put together a directory of where everybody lived and their street addresses, except there were some people who lived in sections one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And Casey Green, the archivist, because he knows his stuff so well, told me those were people who lived down the island outside of the city limits. And then when I had their um, names, we could go to the 1900 census, which mercifully had been collected in June of that year, so that we had accounts of who was on the island, at least in June of 1900. And with the names of the people from the directory, I could find their occupations in the, in the census. And they were dairy farmers, cattle ranchers, fishermen, their employees, and their families. And that gave me the beginning of of a book to be able to think about. Hot on the trail still, and I've just got a few more minutes, I'm hurrying, um, Casey Green found another book for me that um, was written by a Galvestonian that described the West End, or down the island, described the terrain. And I just about fell over when, he, when I found the term sand hills. And down, on the, on, down the island, there were three rows deep of sand hills. They called them sand hills in 1900. And they were anywhere from five to 15 feet high. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, that would make the people down the island, those dairy farmers, fishermen, and cattle ranchers, feel like there was a barrier that would protect them against any major storm. And at the same time in that book, I found the term, the ridge. And um, the ridge is the highest point, it's an exaggeration. There is, there, there's not a ridge on Galveston. It's a slight slope, but it's a few feet higher than the rest of the island. And through interviews and more research in the archives, I discovered that that's where the um, dairy farmers and the cattle ranchers built their houses and their barns on the ridge. So I believed that these people felt that they had a nat two natural barriers at the time of the storm, the, the ridge and the sand hills. And of course, there was no way that these people knew that you know the storm surge was going to be up to 15 feet. There was no way these people knew that they were not protected. Um, and so um, it, was a, it was devastating. Of the 1,200 people in that part of the island, only 300 survived. We have four uh, very good uh, and different perspectives to help us remember Katrina. I'll introduce them in the order of the presentation. Uh, Dr. Neil Frank, uh, raised in Kansas, came to Texas. Uh, some, some parents might wonder why their son would become a meteorologist like mine, wonder how, why I became a historian. In Dr. Frank's uh, case, he was in the Air Force and he lived through three ty tycoons on Okinawa. That'll get your attention. So he uh, came out and got a PhD from Florida State University in meteorology. Um, I think, I don't know this, but it sure sounds from reading his um, past that he, must, he had a very important role in building what we now uh, take for granted as the National Hurricane Center, coming right out of his uh, program working at the National Hurricane Center for 25 years, 13 of those as a director. When you read about what the National Hurricane Center was doing in those years, particularly under Dr. Frank's direction, it's very creative work in, in learning more about hurricanes and learning how to project paths and learning when the time is to say, get the hell out of Dodge, all kind of things that we didn't quite know. Um, Dr. Frank came to Houston in 1987 and worked for Channel 11, KHOU and Houston Channel 11, for the next 20 years. And 
I criticize current weather forecasters when storms come because it seems like their their role is to scare us to death and make us uh, afraid of the fences bouncing from the wind or something, which happened during Rita, as I remember. Dr. Frank didn't do that. He was an educator for 20 years. I, I think most of us watched Dr. Frank when we were certainly when we were we were already afraid of the weather. He had a soothing presence instead of a scary presence, and and you you always learn something from his telecast something that he knew that he was teaching the world at the time and, and outside of his job going out and giving lectures and frequently uh, spreading what he knew about hurricanes that the rest of us didn't. So very um, interested in his perspective on hurricanes in general. Uh, we have um, Mayor Bill White. Um, he's a San Antonian. Um, we all remember him as the mayor of Houston. Um, I would go out on a limb and say the best mayor I've ever lived to in Houston, uh, 2004 to 2010. Uh, he had been the uh, Undersecretary of Energy before that, his education is Harvard in economics and the Texas Law School, lawyer by training. Um, I think the important thing tonight is to remember what happens as it's clear in Houston that something in, in, Houston, in New Orleans is coming toward us and that something is people in trouble. And, and Dr. Um, Bill White and uh, Judge Eccles, Judge Robert Eccles of Harris County, took the lead in organizing the effort that many of us took part in in other ways, but the leadership was coming from the top and it was coming swiftly. And uh, Mayor White did things like uh, help take the lead in creating and managing uh, refuges in the Astrodome, in George Brown Convention Center and other large buildings that he could find around town to use. He, um, he led the programs that we'll talk about in other uh, presentations tonight to feed and house people in, immediately in trouble. But beyond that, he also uh, set up long-term programs to find jobs, to find job placement, to find educational opportunities in Houston, long-term housing. Um, I think above everything else, though, he set the tone for all of us. This is a crisis, and we are going to step forward and deal with it. And I think uh, more than anything, setting the tone for the city uh, got a lot of buy-in from a lot of people all, all over the region. For his efforts, he won the 19, 2007 the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award. I think it's an award that he uh, accepted for all Houstonians as the leader of a, what amounted to a mass movement to help people. Um, also, um, he's always been a supporter of history. As I said, he's now a historian. He's published a book last year called America's Fiscal Constitution, Its Triumph and Collapse, Well Received, and um, hope you're getting more royalties than most historians and academics get. <laughs> <laughs> Um, third is um, Dr. David Peirce. He has been physician director of the Houston Fire Department's EMS service since 1996. Mayor White also appointed him in 2007 to the additional responsibilities of Public Health Authority for Houston. In these positions, he's responsible for the medical aspects of, the clinical, of Houston's clinical care, quality management, disease control, and EMS. These big jobs, hard enough in regular times, become uh, overwhelming almost when the crisis of Katrina hit. Almost everything that had to be done sooner or later found Dr. Peirce to do it. Um, he, he was uh, important in creating and coordinating uh, various things such as setting up a place for elderly people at, at Ellington Field where they could go and get special attention they needed. Processing people arriving at the dome, which was chaotic for days. Uh, controlling outbreaks of diseases. Establishing uh, medical facilities at George R. Brown, which became a very important part of the endeavor. And other tasks too many to note. Um, in, the, in the fifth anniversary magazine, uh, both both men I've just introduced play a very big role in getting motion going that other people can build on. Uh, and, and finally, we have uh, Deanna Rodriguez, 23 years as administrative coordinator for Dr. Peirce, um, plenty um, helping uh, helping to coordinate, plenty to do helping to coordinate anything after Katrina and the aftermath of Katrina. She has worked for HPD EMS for 23 years. She has been a civilian EMT since 2003. And for us, in part, uh, almost uh, many of the pictures, if not all the photographs you're seeing on posters, came from her camera. She's unofficial photographer for HPD, and she really captured in her photographs the human side of, of both the people who were suffering from Katrina and those of us who tried to help them. So. Um, I, I'll uh, turn it over to Dr. Frank, and we'll just uh, we'll allow you to get up when he's through and march down the line. 
In 1900, uh, Isaac Klein, I guess, would have been near the downtown. I'm not exactly sure where his house was, but he went through the storm in his house, and he mentioned that they were had a lull there for a brief period, which tells me that they probably were in the eastern edge of the eye as it went by. And the farms that you mentioned are in the west part of the, of the town. I don't know how far this farm was, whether it was two, three, four miles. About 61st Street. Okay, well, it was a little close because I know they delivered milk mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And of course, if, and I, it seemed like to me, I remember you mentioning the floor level being seven feet or maybe. Five feet. Five, five. Yeah, okay. You're close. But five feet on top of the ridge, <laughs> okay. If they were back far enough, I think it's reasonable that they might have been able, the house might have survived. And you had that right on, and I won't uh, tell you the climax, but the climax was also a hurricane event, or an event associated with hurricanes. Which raises an interesting question. What would happen to Galveston Island today? If we had a repeat of the 1900 storm, or even worse than that, a Camille. You know, Camille was a Category 5 before it weakened a little bit as it crossed the coastline. But it was, it was pushing a Category 5 storm surge. Now, the 1900 storm was a Category 4. A Category 5 will top the seawall. We think the storm surge will be in excess of 20 feet. So the seawall will be topped. Well, I don't have to speculate on what's going to happen. I can show you. All we have to do is look and see what happened on the Bolivar Peninsula after Ike in 2008. Now, you remember Ike? It was an African disturbance, and then it strengthened out over the Atlantic, and you can see the eye there. It was a Category 4 storm at one time, then went through the Caribbean, through Cuba and the islands there, and it weakened some, and then it entered the Gulf of Mexico and um, made landfall at the coast here shortly after midnight on a Saturday, September the 13th. Now this is a depiction of what the radar pattern looked like so that you can see the clear region. That would be the eye, all right? The conditions in a hurricane are always much more severe in the right side looking in the direction of motion than in the left side, and you can see that by looking at the difference in the storm surge. Notice the storm surge over the Bolivar Peninsula was some 15 to 17 feet, could have been 18 feet, and that's very sooner to the storm surge that occurred here in the 1900 storm. That's why the seawall is built at 17 feet. But now take a look at the difference then on Galveston Island, essentially west of the seawall, you can see the storm surge was generally less than 10 feet. So there was a difference in the height of the storm surge of almost 10 feet between the Galveston Island and what took place on the Bolivar Peninsula. Now I'm gonna show you some pictures which illustrate very dramatically the difference in kind of damage that that would cause. Let's start on Galveston Island. We're gonna look at some pictures from Jamaica Beach, and then we're going to Pirates Beach, and then we'll eventually end in Bermuda Beach. Now take a look at this picture here in Jamaica Beach. Notice that there's three rows of homes before the storm. After the storm, there was only two. So the four uh, homes right on the coast were washed away. And FEMA has an interesting program. If you have a house in the first two rows and it's over 50% damage, then you qualify for a buyout. Well, needless to say, these four homes were, were gone, so they all were bought out. But notice the two houses here that appeared. Well, they were also damaged, so all six of those accepted the FEMA buyout. Notice that there's two vacant lots there. Well, the folks in the vacant lots said, hey, we now have beachfront property. Let's head down there real quick and build a house. So they built the two houses there, and they do now have beachfront property. Once that property is purchased by FEMA, then it's turned over to Galveston, and so nothing will ever be built there. Now let's go to Pirates Beach. You'll notice now the uh, house with the orange roof on it. Incidentally, I've indicated houses that survived by a square. If it's a circle, that means they disappeared. One, two, three houses ahead of that one, all three of them were totally gone. This is high-end property, incidentally, at Pirates Beach. And it's interesting, in 2014, uh, all of them were vacant. Well, I found out that the two beachfront uh, lot owners decided to accept the FEMA buyout, 
And the folks in the third, in the fourth house there said, boy, we have a great golf view now. Well, it didn't last very long. <laughs> Big house, 2015, was built right in front of the beautiful view. And the geotube, there was some plastic tubes that were sold down there numbers of years ago and said that's going to protect the property. Well, it didn't do a very good job. That house is totally gone. And the second house decided to accept the buyout. Uh, normally, you would expect the house on the beach to experience the most damage. In this case, it was a second house that was disappeared, and both of them have accepted the buyout. Now let's go to Bermuda Beach. The house that you see there with the dark roof, it survived Alicia, a very, very well-built house. Um, as a matter of fact, the family that lived there felt it was hurricane-proof. Well, not quite. Both of those houses are gone, and the house that you see with the tan roof, they also accepted the buyout. If you live on Galveston Island, you know the name Severance. In 2005, a lawyer by the name of Severance bought three beachfront houses for rental purposes. And if you live on the island or you're familiar, we had an Open Beach Act at that time. And, and it was anticipated the county, that the state was going to come along and require all of the people that uh, had beachfront homes there to move them because the vegetation line had moved back ahead of their home. Well, she bought these houses at a pretty decent price. And then in 2006, when they were told that they were going to have to move their houses at their expense, she sued and she won. So the Open Beach Act no longer is in effect down there. Notice her house was damaged. This was a, take, a picture taken by Brian Carlick. Notice hers was the only house that survived there along the beachfront. Well, she sold out her house for $315,000. The price that FEMA paid is the pre-hurricane price. This is a Bermuda Beach, actually Spanish Grant, but there's eight houses there, all only two survived, and all accepted the buyout. So altogether, there were 98 homes on Galveston Island that were totally destroyed. FEMA bought 72 of those. Now let's compare that with what happened over on the Bolivar Peninsula. You have Crystal Beach. If you go way out the east end, you have Rollover Pass and Gilcrest, and then High Island is back a little bit higher. There were 5,000 homes on the Bolivar Peninsula before the storm. 3,500 of them were totally destroyed. Notice this big house on the left there. This was owned by a, a judge out of Port Arthur, and there were 10 beachfront, house, beachfront houses uh, to the east of him. Now, I'm going to change the camera angle a little bit. See that house that is circled there? That's it that you see in the foreground. Notice I've boxed a house there at the background. It did survive, and you can see there was extensive damage well, well inland, not just beachfront property itself, and most of those houses have been rebuilt. This is another perspective of that on the left hand side you can see the judge's home and there's the 10 beach houses on the bottom I've indicated the houses that were destroyed 45 were destroyed 22 have been rebuilt it's interesting to take a look at the house in the lower box it doesn't look very very big and it wasn't but it was well built so it survived now notice the house that I've circled there well the owners of that house Excuse me, their house disappeared, but they found out that the uh, people ahead of them were willing to sell their, uh, sell their lot. So now they're convinced they've got beachfront property, and they built this big house there. This is a picture of it. Well, it turns out that the lot owner ahead of them decided to resist the FEMA buyout and has built this big house that kind of obstructs their view. Way up in the upper left-hand corner, White House, that was the only one that survived. I counted 115 houses in this picture alone that were destroyed. 89 have been rebuilt. Now, it was interesting that about 150 people stayed on the Bolivar Peninsula rather than evacuate because it was only a Category 2 storm. Well, on Friday, they realized they were in real trouble, and the Coast Guard evacuated about 75 with helicopter, which means maybe 75 remained on the island. Well, one couple had to abandon their house when it was flooded, and so they waded in, in chest deep water to the church, was on a little higher ground, opened the door, and were greeted by a lion. There was somebody down there that had a little mini zoo, and he took the lion. <laughs> you never know, Mayor, what you're going to run into. 
in the shelter. But as bad as things were in Crystal Beach, they were even worse in Gilchrist. There were 500 homes there before the house. Only two survived that were livable. <clears throat> the house that you see there with the with the white roof. Now I'm going to show you a picture that nobody has ever seen. I ran into this uh, about two weeks ago. Found out that there was an airline pilot used to fly for Brantleth. Remember that airline? But he has a small airplane. He also had a house just west of Rollover Pass. So he was so concerned about what happened to that that he jumped in his airplane around noon. The storm was still over the uh, over the uh, Galveston Bay. The winds were gusting to over 50 miles an hour, and he took off and flew down there and took this picture. The reason you've never seen it because he violated the no-fly zone to get the picture and he didn't want anyone to find out that he had done that. At this time, this would have been 12, after, 12 hours after the eye passed, the water was still 68 feet above mean sea level. At the height of the storm, the water was to the top of the pilings here in the Adams home. This is what the Adams home looked like before the storm. It's kind of interesting that they had bought a home on this lot prior to Rita. And it really caused a lot of damage, and they found out that the pilings had dry rotted, so they bulldozed the house down and built it back much stronger. There was a church ahead of them and a couple of homes ahead of that, and, and they survived because they put the floor level, it, I, I estimate that it's probably 16 feet above a water level, and they are back up from the beach some, so they did survive. Well, how are they doing today? Well, they bought the two beachfront lots, so now they do have beachfront property, and they bought a couple of lots across the street and opened a bar and restaurant. <laughs> well, what about Gilcrest? 500 homes there before the storm, only two survived. FEMA has bought out 383 of those lots, so it'll never be the same again. We were down there a couple of weeks ago, and there's only been 62 houses rebuilt there, and the state is threatening to close Rollover Pass. It was interesting that way out towards High Island, there was a series of six homes that survived there, but notice the floor level was 18 feet above sea level. So the water ran under those homes. So what, are, what did we learn? Among other things, if you're going to build down there, build high. And I think on Galveston and Island and also on the Bolivar Peninsula, if you're on the beachfront itself, you have to build your house at 17 feet or the floor at 17 feet. Well, I believe the house on the left is at 17 feet. If that's the case, then the house on the right <laughs> must be at 30 feet. One of the things they're finding the insurance companies will reduce your rate if you go higher. I don't know, if you get to 30 feet, maybe, maybe the insurance company will pay you. <laughs> but here's the problem. Now you're up where the winds are strong. So you go way up there. If you don't build that thing very strong, then the wind is going to do a lot of damage. Well, what about the protection for southeast Texas now? I'm particularly concerned about the industrial area at the north end of Galveston Bay. If it was wiped out, it would be not only a national tragedy, but it would also be an international tragedy. Yeah, I'm concerned about the houses on the beach down on, uh, in Pirates Beach, but I'm more concerned about that, the north end of Galveston Bay. So one proposal is the Ike Dyke. I think it's rather interesting. Another proposal is to put a hurricane gate halfway up the bay. That might be something to consider also. Now the question is, what if Katrina had come here? Well, it would be even worse than I showed you in these particular pictures. Two books I'd refer to after Ike. There you can see the picture on that. An Infinite Monster. Uh, these two ladies work for, I think, the Galveston newspaper in their excellent books. I assume that you've probably seen those. Okay. You got it. Okay. Thank you. It's like an uh, old home for me, you know. I, when I was serving the people here, then I got used to Dr. Frank getting up in the morning, get a cup of coffee, and I'd go on this from about May 1 through early October on the National Hurricane Service. And I got pretty good at that. I didn't know much about hurricanes, I got to tell you, before then, but I got some tutoring uh, from uh, some experts, and uh, it's something now I know about that I won't use very much, except to say that uh, I'll learn something every day. One thing I learned today is I'm not going to build on the Galveston Beach. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I just, <laughs> and as a sort of, I guess you call it, fiscal conservative, I am not so sure I'm thrilled about paying for people who build their houses and take the risk. Uh, so where do I start? 
I, I will say something about, I, I did learn also some about meteorologists. Uh, you know, I've read books about, you know, uh, hurricanes and natural disasters. I'm a little bit nerdy and like history. And uh, what a great contribution we heard about today. But there was one, Isaac Storm, that I'd read when I was a kid and another, Control of Nature by John McPhee. Some people don't know about that, but I'd, I'd been blessed to have read it before Katrina hit. And the lesson of that book, you know, a third of the book was the hubris and thinking that the Mississippi River levees would hold. Yeah. So, uh, say, uh, you know, Dr. Peirce, there were people in our Houston Fire Department as part of a Texas task force that were prepositioned outside of New Orleans before Hur Hurricane Katrina. Uh, so it wasn't, yeah. they, they were some of the first uh, on the spot. A lot of attention is given to Houstonians who did things in Houston, I just want to say there were there were rescue missions done by uh, Houston Fire Department that were being done immediately after the storm. But there was a lot of ignorance as well. Because I'd read these books and knew a few things, and uh, I knew there were organizations that had better communications than many in state and local governments. So uh, on the Monday morning after Kirk, Hurricane Katrina hit, when the national news was saying everything was fine because you had reporters in the streets and it looked okay and the heavy wind damage wasn't there. Uh, I called the, the CEO of Shell Oil Company at a refinery facility on the coast and they knew that the levees had broken before I heard it on the national news or from the White House or anybody else. Now, it, once the levees break, then the city becomes uninhabitable. And other the storm sewers and the water system is down. Power lines, you can't get to the power lines that are submerged. Uh, so some of the transmission lines. So without power, electricity, clean water, sewage, you have a, a place, but you don't have a habitable city anymore. So about noon that day, I gathered people around uh, and said, first, the senior staff of the city, I said, our, you know, our lives are going to be different in the next 90 days. There's going to be already, there, there were far more people, get this now, what I'm going to say. There are more people in our metropolitan area that Monday and Tuesday than came from the Superdome and the like. What was happening? Well, see, they had a mandatory evacuation that was late. It was late. Be candid. You know, Saturday night, too late. <laughs> they didn't mobilize the things that we did. Uh, to help people get out. And so there was a mad scramble, big freeway, you know, traffic, some people discouraged to get out. So it was late, but a lot of people had been watching it. And uh, they were packing hotels and motels from here to Corpus Christi, but the most of them were in this area, or with friends and relatives that were in this area, or in the Red Cross shelters, or in shelters that were established in many of the churches throughout this community ad hoc shelters because we have a lot of folks in Houston who've come here from Louisiana, including my wife. And, uh, and uh, there are a vast number of people in shelters before buses started coming, before people started evacuating. Uh, just a note on organization. Uh, I'd had some good mentors in life and run some big organizations, so I did know one thing. Uh, that if you define, clearly define two or three or four critical tasks, you assign people by name in front of peers to handle that task. And then you check up and you report back to each other every day. And if somebody drops a ball, you substitute somebody new in. If somebody needs an additional resource and do, they're doing a good job, you give them more resources and keep the responsibilities where they are. Then you can, you can, you know, move mountains. Put another way, some people were overwhelmed by the fact we had 200,000 people here. But from a management perspective, which a lot of people in government never look at, I realized that if we had five million people in this community, in the metropolitan area, and we divided up the work, we could handle 200,000 people. 
but it had to transcend government, it had to transcend public organizations, it had to transcend the Red Cross, which is really only set up for about a 72-hour shelter operation. We had to create a virtual organization, and we did. And uh, there's some long stories I could tell you about that, but that's how we did it. Uh, and incredible response. Uh, you needed competent organizations. Uh, corporations are pretty competent. I'd give call up CEOs of corporations and gives them two apartment complexes. Get everybody fed. You know, then we got to get them into we got to get them into apartments. Six hundred apartment owners uh, form you know formed an organization within ten days that we convened to divide up apartments. They told us there were twenty thousand vacant apartments in the whole metropolitan area. By early December, we had thirty-five thousand apartments that, that were occupied normally with about four people each so that gives you a sense of the magnitude at the peak so that people would not be you know peop you want to treat people the way you'd like to be treated and here's the deal you can't look back we're judged by them this earth and we should judge ourselves not by what happens to us that we can't control but how we react to that and if you have people sitting like FEMA wanted to in a bunch of trailer cities or one time they wanted to haul people off and put them on a cruise boat, then how can you get it, you know, kids in school, seek jobs, on with your life, you know? And so, I mean, we, you know, Americans are pretty hardy. I mean, there's some people who come here, their ancestors survived the brutal journey in a slave ship. There are people who've, you know, come uh, on the tops of uh, rail cars from Central America there's people who have endured quite a bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you give people some chance and hope for the future, then human beings can be resilient if you just give them a little chance to live with dignity and respect and not think of themselves as victims. So there's a little uh, Ken Maddox who was interviewed here. He had warned me that about a weekend, we're going to face Dr. Peirce a bunch of suicides because, uh, you know, all this mass disaster, people have lost everything, right? At first, they'll be in shock, and then there'll be depression, mass depression. And then he came with me about three weeks later to say, hey, guess what? We had lower than the normal number of suicides uh, because people were looking at the forward and not looking back. People were helping them, so they had a web uh, to sustain them. And then finally, where it stands in Houston's history, First, on the natural disaster scale, I got to say, you know, I've had some a little learning from, you know, and now a little bit more today, but on worst case scenarios of weather disasters, and uh, Katrina was uh, different than anybody had planned for because it's what happens if a another major American city is destroyed and now you're home for a couple hundred thousand people. Okay, that's one type of disaster that people didn't think about. But uh, then there's a disaster that hits us pretty good. And let me just tell you that uh, the, as Dr. Frank said, you know, the worst case is something that has a lot of rains, a lot of power, where that uh, northwest eye wall hits right in the ship channel, you know, in Galveston Bay, so that it, it hits our heavy industry and really hits our, uh, gives a, a big uh, right hook into the uh, ability of the United States to get gasoline <laughs> and 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 uh, have that storm surge push up the bayou system at the same time a little slower than Hurricane Ike so that you get some rains that sit. If we would have had rain sit in Ike, I will tell you our bayou system our bayou system was at capacity. <laughs> you know, now if we would have had about eight or nine more hours of that, then we would have experienced what happened in, of all places, Louisville and Cincinnati when the storm slowed down and started dumping water. We had mass flooding in the Midwest. We avoided that in Houston as bad as the wind was because that storm had such strong winds uh, that it you know, took down 100,000 trees plus probably took down about a fifth of the big trees in the city, you know, but uh, it, it didn't and, and, and took the power lines down. And then, but 
we got we got to prepare for the future. I also like the comment, "Don't panic." I mean, what you had in the hurricane uh, after when Hurricane Rita was coming right at us, and it, it, then it made a turn. Okay, it hit a front, and that front was like a wall, so it made a turn. Uh, so it went to the five percent probability case rather than fifty percent probability seventy two hours out, which would have been the you know close to the worst case. Uh, but Ike was, uh, you know, Ike was pretty bad. <laughs> but uh, what happened during Hurricane Rita is everybody saw what happened in, in southern Louisiana. And post some survey showed that rather than people evacuating the mandatory evacuation areas, or as I and Judge Eichel said, you know, there's some people, if, if you can't stand to be without power, like if you have, you know, on a heart machine or, you know, dialysis or something like that, you need to get to where there's going to be power because we could have a big power outage. But what we found out is a lot of people took every vehicle they owned, put all their possessions, and got on the road at the same time, regardless of whether they're in the storm surge. I hope we, I hope people remember that too, because that too can cause human suffering. Finally, the 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 real significance of uh, Katrina in Houston's history is, uh, in my view, uh, it it has something very powerful and deep about the image of our city. You know, we were the shining light of a combination of compassion and competence at a time when there was a national failure of competence and leadership. We were here, but let me just tell you that all over the world, there were images of what was happening in New Orleans and at a time when we were projecting so much military power into other countries trying to remake their societies we seemed to be unable to get our own citizen off roofs. Uh, and so we played a big role that changed our self-image and the image of Houston in the minds of others. Uh, but there was something even more basic, is that, uh, you know, we got people, we still have, you know, two of the richest people that were in New Orleans are now living in Houston. They run big companies. We got people from the top of the executive suite to the people who are sweeping the floor, which is, you get everybody, and then you can't do it without stereotype. It was stereotypes. It is true that quite a few of the people that were stranded were disproportionately uh, had low income uh, and were African American. And Houston had been. I mean, just I'm stating history, not an opinion. It was a segregationist city with racist leadership for decades of its existence. And then you saw this community where on the national news, people were just talking about, you know, they were already introducing the race thing. And most Houstonians, they just saw fellow Americans in need. It wasn't just rhetoric. I mean, people acted on their beliefs. Word actions are more powerful than words. And so for many people in Houston, as well as Houstonians who had remembered this legacy of our past, uh, it was a very special time uh, when we put, or the people of faith were able to put their faith uh, to good work. And to, in, in a way, I say this, it's in a little book, uh, a lady came up to me at church, the African American church afterwards, she said, you know, she never thought she thought they'd change the law, but they would never change beliefs in her lifetime. It'd take a few generations. But she saw the outpouring that occurred where people were just trying to help people. And it wasn't my people or your people. It was just a fellow American. And you know, I forget exactly her words, but Houston had grown up. Well, talk about a couple of tough acts to follow. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. So um, as I sat trying to think about what I was going to say, I, I think I'm going to talk about two big takeaways I have from my experience with, uh, with Katrina and, and Rita and the others. You know, one is that you know, when this began, and for every, every one of us who's here and everyone who participated in it, you know, it evolved day to day. And as, as it evolved, it, it grew. And it grew and it grew. And so for those of you who have read the, the book, there's a, in my section there, I talk about how, um, actually the weekend before the storm, I had been doing a project in my backyard and I started five o'clock Friday and basically it wasn't until about six o'clock Sunday night that I turned on the news again. I was just 
you know, working on that, that project the whole weekend. So I was a little bit oblivious. So now on Friday, or, you know, the storm, there was a storm in the Atlantic on the east coast of Florida. And it didn't look too terribly ominous. Well, by Sunday night, the story had changed a whole bunch. And, um, uh, and I remember thinking, well, it stinks to be in New Orleans because uh, it looked like it was going to head towards New Orleans. But even then, I didn't realize, I didn't, I didn't understand what, what was about to occur. And so then I got a call from uh, my counterpart in public health from Harris County, uh, Dr. Hermenia Palacio, and she was saying that the county judge had spoke with the mayor of New Orleans and had agreed that the folks that were in the Superdome, they were going to bring them over here to the Astrodome. We were going to take care of them because they were, you know, the problems were developing. Of course, by this time, everybody knew the problems were, were developing. And so we had a meeting at Transtar, and, and we sat down, and, and I remember we had a dry erase board, and we're, we're putting up, well, we're going we're gonna to probably need 200 cots. <laughs> and we're, we're going to probably need five ambulances. And, you know, because people are probably, some of these people, some might be sick. And um, uh, we'll need three security guards 24 hours a day. I'm telling you, you're going to need them all day. And, uh, and you know, so we started laying these plans. And it, it's, it's almost comical how, how naive we were. But the, the point was that, that as it grew, we quickly responded. I mean, things quickly changed. We quickly ramped up. And we, uh, and here, when it was first just the Houston Harris County folks, you know, we already worked very closely together. And so there is this, this uh, air of us that when you come into the room and we're going to work on a project, you kind of leave your jersey at the door. You know, you're not Harris County, you're not City of Houston, you're not, you know, you leave your jersey at the door. We're one team. And as it grew, and more and more agencies, and many of them were volunteers from the community and, and organizations we hadn't historically worked with, um, that tone was maintained, that you, know, you leave your jersey at the door. And, and the, the interesting thing that was going on was, and, and, and Mayor White touched on this, but the atmosphere of how we all have a really big job to do, and it is growing, and there is, a sense that you know we are going to tackle this. We don't know what's coming, but we are going to tackle whatever comes our way. Uh, it became infectious, and and I, I sometimes think that that was maybe the mortar between the bricks as we built this house was that that sense that you know, come whatever, we are going to succeed, and and that was set by the leaders. That that tempo was set by the leaders, and and there were some naysayers. Of course, there's always going to be some naysayers, but. The momentum of the populace of those, you know, the the populace of those who, of us who were trying to to uh, to respond to this, became so overwhelming that the naysayers quickly converted, well, most of them, uh, quickly converted uh, their tone, and so, and things things would occur that you just you just couldn't imagine. Uh, problems would pop up that were just completely off the radar that we would have to deal with, and so, um, so for example. Back in Tropical Storm Allison, before Tropical Storm Allison, we had had conversations locally from the medical standpoint that we needed to have a central medical operations center in case there was ever a, a, a big uh, disaster that occurred. You know, this is the home of the Texas Medical Center. It's obviously, you know, the largest medical center in the world. It could be its own city. It would actually, it would be a small state. You know, if you, if you talk to the people who uh, run that, they, their, their numbers say it would be a, a small state. And, and many, many people are employed there. And more importantly, many, many people get excellent care there. So if something disastrous from a medical standpoint came to Houston, certainly we'd have the infrastructure to handle it, right? Well, not without planning. And so we had, before Allison, we had had the conversations. Then when Tropical Storm Allison hit, which is a, you know, a distant memory for many folks, but won't be for me, we lost five hospitals within six hours when Tropical Storm Allison, when I say lost, they lost all their power. They became non-entities in terms of being able to provide care for the, for the community. They became liabilities because with no power and no light in the middle of the night, that meant no life support. And so you had janitors and unit secretaries in the ICU squeezing the bag, breathing for somebody in the dark with a flashlight in their mouth, a pen light in their mouth. And yet, you know, you, you could never imagine that that would ever happen. That's just completely beyond your imagination. Yet it did, and people immediately responded. And so with Allison, we, not only do we have that immediate, you know, minute to minute emergency that occurred, but then over the next several days, and you know it takes at least three or four days to evacuate a hospital? Because that's how, and the only reason I know that is because, nobody, who would ever think of that? Who would ever calculate that, right? Because that's what it was. It took that many days for some of the big hospitals in, in Houston to, to evacuate. And then it took them six months to get back online. 
And so when when Rita, I'm sorry, when, when Katrina hit, we had all these folks coming in, we had the blessing of having infrastructure. We had the blessing of having people who had been through something difficult in the medical arena before. Uh, we had the blessing that we had been forced to work together under austere conditions before. Um, yet during Katrina, things occurred that you just you just couldn't imagine. That you know things popped up that you just you couldn't imagine, and we had to deal with them one at a time. But they had to be dealt with. And so one of my other mantras became, when a plan when a problem comes up, we are going to set a plan. And the moment we get done with that plan, you're going to develop a contingency plan for when your plan goes wrong, <laughs> because it invariably does. And you are irresponsible if you haven't already thought of the contingency plan for when plan A derails. And the other thing you have to do is you have to understand things about human nature and what, what is it that motivates people? What are people likely to do? And what I found in my career is that when people are, are placed in situations of tremendous stress, they tend to do two things. One is they will act, they will do something, but they're going to choose to do something which in their mind is both important and, and that they are confident that they will do well. So understanding that's human nature as you develop your plan that has got to be part of the equation. Don't take people and force them into doing something which is totally foreign to them because they're going to panic and they're going to derail and you're, you're going to lose the camaraderie and the morale and their, their ability to do something, something else. And so for example, there was, um, there was one time we, we were trying to move a, a whole bunch of folks and there was a uh, Boy Scout troop and it was a Boy Scout troop of adult men with disabilities. And uh, this was during, during Allison, actually. And so they were, went to one of the hospitals and they were gonna help. They had in their mind that they were going to uh, hand out food to people. Well, there was no food to be handed out. But these were adult men and they were strong. And they, in fact, one of the things that they did in this Boy Scout troop, if you will, is that they went to the gym and they worked out together. So guess what they got to do? They got to carry patients down the stairs. And they were, it was something which was important. It was something which was in their scope of practice, if you will. It was within the, something that they were able to do. And they felt that it was, you know, they felt worthwhile about it. And so one of my takeaways from all of this is that you can't predict what's going to happen next. Um, when something goes, goes wrong, and some of the other responding agencies were accused of this, is that when something goes wrong and it's not something that you're used to dealing with, you know, it may not be your fault, but it is still your responsibility to solve that problem. And so you have to think outside the box, and you have to you have to solve the problem, and you can't let you can't let the rules, the bureaucratic <coughs> rules, uh, get in your way. Well, I I don't have authorization to do that. Well, you do now, right? I mean, if you don't, something horrible is going to happen. You have to act. You have to step up and act. And and and, and people did that. And then um, the the other thing is that is that in in my uh, in my career in my in my life, I I grew up in Buffalo, New York. When I was 17 years old. We got hit by the blizzard of 77. And I know you all remember that very well. <laughs> <clears throat> but in the blizzard of 77, we didn't really get that much snow. What happened was on Lake Erie, there was uh, several inches of snow had accumulated on top of the ice. Um, and this happens every winter across the ice. But it was mostly, it was really what it was. It wasn't so much a snowstorm as it was a windstorm. But the wind picked up all of that snow off of Lake Erie and blew it towards uh, western New York. And when it hit the land and the, hit the topography, it wound up dumping and making drifts. And we had drifts which were as much as 40 feet deep, and I'm not making that up. We had to get uh, snow plows that came, not plows, uh, uh, snow blowers, these machines I'd never seen before from way up in Canada where the, it's on the truck and the, the blower, which is usually at street level, actually can rise up and basically sort of eat into a mountain of snow and blow it. And that's what we had to do to get to people's homes. So there was that much, there was that much snow, and I, I was a basic EMT, and I just started working on, on the ambulance um, back then, and uh, so, so I had worked at, at that level of just you know overwhelming. What are we going to do? And you're working you know five six days in a row because there's nobody else who can come into work. And the ambulance couldn't move much, so you did a lot of you know taking the stretcher, you and your partner taking the stretcher, and you're carrying it down several blocks to to get to somebody and bringing them back. Uh, when I was a resident doing my uh, uh, medical training in Los Angeles, there were a couple of earthquakes. And what I learned there was what's, when there's an earthquake and the roads and the, the streets collapse, the, the overpasses collapse, and the hospital is rock and roll and everything gets broken, what's the first thing hospitals run out of? Diapers. <laughs> and the reason they run out of diapers is because they usually get diapers delivered every day because they take up a lot of space on the shelf and they go through a lot of them. And so instead of stockpiling large amounts because it takes up the whole warehouse, they routinely get them every day. So that's one of the first things that they run out of. Well, you know what goes into diapers, right? Okay, you can't have a bunch of babies with lots of diaper content 
around for very long because that's a health risk, not only to the babies, but obviously to everybody in the, in the facility. And so um, there are, that's why it's an example of things that happen that you just can't imagine this is gonna be a problem, but you have got to solve those problems. And we, we had that here, and I think you should all really be proud of, of uh, your friends and neighbors in this community because when we talk about what Harris County did and what the city of Houston did and what the state of Texas did, really a lot of it was the people of Houston because it never would have worked without all the volunteers that came, the, the volunteer effort. The biggest problem with the volunteers was coordinating the volunteers. Um, but um, you shall be very proud of Houston, and, and uh, I've lived here for 20 years, and uh, I plan to be here for the rest of my career because this is the place where when things go wrong, everybody rolls up their sleeves and gets the job done. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, distinguished panel. Dr. Frank, Mayor White, Dr. Purse, my boss for 20 years. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the University of Houston for this great history project and uh, Dr. Debbie Harwell, Dr. Pratt. And of course, I have to mention con todo cariño, with all my heart, I want to remember fondly Dr. Ernesto Valdez. Oh. Yeah, um, I'm sure he's enjoying many Mexican pastries in the great beyond. <laughs> the last time I saw him, I gave him CDs of our photos and I say our photos because also Chief Almaguer, who's here in the audience, had some of his photos in there too, and uh, my Catholic guilt won't let me <laughs> go on without mentioning that some of the photos may be his. And I got credit for this photo, which is not mine. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, um, the last time I saw Ernesto, I tried to call him, make sure he could open up all the CDs with the photos, and then I just couldn't get a hold of him, and um, I finally reached his family, and they told me the sad news. Uh, during that time, our offices at the Houston Fire Department EMS moved, and our phone numbers changed, and I really didn't think about the project ever again. I, I just, you know, I thought, well, he's gone. Well, one morning, Dr. Purse came in and said, guess what? Some of your pictures are online. <laughs> so I Googled and sure enough, I found the magazine online. And I was so thrilled, I called U of H and uh, got some copies and gave them to my family members and said, you know, I need this at my funeral. <laughs> this is wonderful. So, um, uh, you know, when I spoke with Ernesto, he uh, recorded our conversation and I never imagined that some of our conversation would end up in this book. I, I mean, I certainly don't even feel like I should be up here with these uh, <laughs> distinguished folks, but uh, I very much appreciate the... Um, in, on August 31st in 2005, Dr. Purse asked me if I was available <coughs> to go out to Ellington, and I really didn't know what to expect. Uh, during tropical storm Allison, if you remember, as they mentioned, all those horrible floods. You know, we worked out of Reliant every day, and uh, the Army set up a hospital. I mean, there was just such a buzz, and basically we didn't have an iPad at that time. We just, I had a yellow legal pad and my Rolodex and my little flip phone, and we were running phone calls back and forth from his car, from wherever. So. It felt like it was a training for what was happening now with Ellington and with Katrina. Uh, that evening, we arrived at Ellington and waited anxiously for those planes to arrive. And I'm sure you've seen the pictures with the mounds of wheelchairs, mounds of stretchers. I, you just really, I don't think anyone knew what to expect. And. Uh, one of those pictures is one of my favorites with the NASA planes in the background and the elderly patients on the gurneys. I mean, that's just, it's surreal. Chief Almaguer and myself took pictures that day. Uh, he helped me climb on a chair and take some pictures. And um, we traveled to the Astrodome when the first buses arrived. You could see the poor people inside desperate to get out, wanting to touch dry ground. Um, that weekend, I volunteered. It was Labor Day. Uh, I'm a salaried employee. I wasn't going to get any overtime, and I 
told my family, I, I want to work the yellow lot. I, I felt like all the other Houstonians that just wanted to do something for these people. Um, when I told people I was working there, they would say, oh, you're with those Katrina people. And I, I told them, I, you don't understand. I mean, these people are so grateful. These people were broken. They had nothing. Some of the children arrived with no shirts on, nothing. You know, we grabbed some teddy bears that we had to put on the ambulances and took them to the Georgia Brown to pass them out. I, I get goosebumps. Um, it was tough. Those evacuees would thank me profusely for a bottle of water, and I felt like I didn't do anything to deserve that, uh, especially not in comparison to our HFD first responders, EMTs, paramedics that were helping the sick and injured. I'm very much a behind the scenes person. I enjoy taking photographs. I've been very grateful for the experiences that my job has provided. And I've been privileged with a front row seat to some of the finest work by our Houston firefighters, EMTs and paramedics, and our medical staff, our doctors, nurses. And that also goes to say for the Katrina response. I just want to mention this little baby is 10 years old now. I, I wish I could meet her again. Um, I have to tell you a little story about her. I asked this family if I could take a picture of their baby. And I said, you know, if it's OK, I didn't want to intrude. I was very careful. I tried not to take flash photographs of anyone tried to respect their privacy, but this baby was so cute, and they'd just come off a yellow school bus, sweating, just trying to get clean diapers, formula. And the lady was kind of shy, and I noticed she was uncomfortable. And she finally broke down in tears and said, it's not my baby. It's my niece's baby, and we're going to try to find her at the Astrodome. And I realized they were about to get sent to the Georgia Brown. So we quickly got one of the senior captains, and I told him, look, we've got to get these people right here to the dome, not to the Georgia Brown. So I'm just hoping all these years that they've reconnected. And uh, you know, she's a 10-year-old little baby now. I want to thank my family, and I want to thank my brother, Jesse Vasquez, who's here and with his wife, Maria. They drove in from Galveston County, and I appreciate you sharing the evening with us. And I want to thank him especially for teaching me everything I know about photography <laughs> with a film camera. <laughs> and, um, you know, he documented some of the black and white photos that have been shown of Hurricane Carla, the aftermath of Carla. I didn't take pictures then. I was like one. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, and go Astros. <laughs> Well, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I don't know whether it's on or not, but I can tell you. Uh, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. The uh, the first thing I say is that okay. So we have Red Cross shelters, and we had George R. Brown and and the Astrodome, uh, and very quickly we mobilized and asked for uh, the mega churches, essentially, uh, to take responsible for food and feeding. We did also call on every, you know, if there was a shortage of food, listen, I mean, Walmart, HEB, we got food. We had more of a problem with food in the, some of the motels, where especially if people didn't have wheels and they didn't have money. Uh, that took a little bit more effort. Once we put out the call to Eustonians to donate stuff, then we had, well, by the end of September, we had 10 large industrial warehouses 
which were organized with baby formula, diapers, foods, blankets, clothes. We had so much clothes that they would have, you know, you know, I didn't want to, I don't want to sound ungenerous, but we could have closed the state. And we wound up having a lot of it uh, later on put on C five A's to take to a hurricane stricken in northern area in northern Pakistan where sixty thousand people were homeless and tens of thousands died. More residual. Right? Yeah, residual. So uh, the food wasn't as big of a problem. Where how you provide the medical needs for all the people and then how you get people in housing with 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 uh, electricity and furniture those were a little bigger logistical stories and I wind up by saying that as we organize this volunteer effort some of y'all may have heard this uh, it was you know as I say it was mega churches and bishops people who could act and organize large numbers of people there were some food venal food food vendors who had contracts for the Astrodome and uh, George R. Brown and one of them won and one of them lost. Let me just say, I told them to sue me. Uh, but, you know, because they provide concessions for the games with a markup and I I'm cheap. And so this was sort of donated and FEMA reimbursed it. it none of it came out of the, the city or county taxpayers. But on September the 11th, the Greater Islamic, the, the Islamic Society of Greater Houston wanted to take responsibility for feeding because they thought it was important in view of what some people who call themselves Muslims did on September 11th, that they show that they were there to serve everybody. Uh, it was interesting. Me to, I don't know. Uh, I, I do know that we looked at, I mean, this is a little different topic, but what ought to happen, but there's also vested interests, okay? Uh, do you find that amazing? Uh, but guess what? There are really big hurricanes that go over Japan, and you can't drive 400 miles away or 500 miles away. So uh, when it comes to the uh, senior centers and protect, particular pedi uh, geriatric care with people who have assisted living, we ought to have really high, we ought to have a certain building standard if you're in a, a, a storm flood area. But uh, that would require backbone of state officials <laughs> um, thank you all for coming out here. And um, I don't know who to direct this to, but in the brief planning time that there was uh, in, to prepare the response to Katrina, are there any other cities that um, planning committees looked at and in terms of a model to implement something as <coughs> another, a structure that may have been in the could I do that? I mean, no. And the reason is that you'd never really had a big, you know, in eva evacuation of most of one of the largest cities, country to another city. And uh, Dr. Peirce said it, the most important thing is, uh, well, let me put it, the, uh, President Eisenhower, both when he was head of the military in Europe in World War II and then as president, he used to have a saying which was, uh, planning is indispensable, but plans are worthless. And Perth was there at some of these meetings. I mean, we did a lot of improv Im improvisation. And, uh, and, and, but it was not ill-informed improvisation. And if something didn't work, we quickly changed it. As he said, you have to have a contingency plan. But, you know, we didn't have time to do that. We didn't have time to study a bunch of bureaucrats. 
Can, can I add one thing to that? So, um, so the answer to the question, you know, no, we didn't. But uh, since then, and I started talking about before Tropical Storm Allison, we had talked about having a center for medical operations in case a catastrophe occurred. And uh, when, uh, when Allison hit, we sort of quickly threw something together that sort of matched what our, our thoughts were. And that's how the five hospitals got evacuated. That's how the other hospitals were able to absorb that, uh, the, that patient load. Um, and, and that's how they got coordinated because there was lots of, I mean, there were literally thousands of patients who were in hospitals. There were five hospitals with each one of them having, you know, maybe 200 to 400 patients each, depending on the size of the hospital. And they, so there was over a thousand patients had to get moved and, and absorbed within the rest of the community. And then you got to remember, you know, from day to day, just the same rate of, of health needs was going to continue. So, um, so we now today have a thing which we call the CMOC, which is the Catastrophic Medical Operations Center. And so between Allison and when Katrina hit, we had, we had sort of put that together. And then when Katrina hit and we had all those folks come in, it really, it really got tested. Uh, it got tested even more when, when Rita came on. Mm -hmm. And the reason for it was, A, Houston was pretty saturated with, with new medical cases. And we all thought that Rita was going to make a direct hit, and so there was this huge evacuation. And basically, from a, a medical standpoint, everything from the south loop to the coast, all the hospitals, all the nursing homes, all the extended care, all the long-term care facilities, they all evacuated. And so then the, the storm made that hard right and went into East Texas. Well, first of all, a whole lot of folks had evacuated into East Texas, mm -hmm. where there's not as much infrastructure. And when they made that, that turn, we were fortunate in that there were many DMATs. They were called disaster medical assistance. There were many of those across the Gulf region between Louisiana and, and, uh, and Texas. And so some of them were there and others responded in there. And the state of Texas made what would seem like the logical move of uh, we're going to take all of the medical needs there and we're going to send them into Houston, the home of the largest medical center in the world and has had good weather and just did a good job with Katrina. What they didn't keep in their equation was that we were full. We, a, we were full, and then we'd evacuated over two million folks. So, um, but the CMOC was able to was able to, to manage that because we had developed a network really across basically half of Texas, so that as patients came in, and we saw this at Ellington during the evacuation from from New Orleans, a C5 would land, and the and this is in the book, and the the, the manifest in that C5 would be, be written on a piece of paper, and you know patient one, you know, in a name, and patient two in a name, and you go to the patient one and you look at the armband because maybe it's somebody, in fact, they were almost always from nursing homes. Some of them could communicate, some of them couldn't. There's a name tag, so you know who it is. And you look for the paperwork, and there's no paperwork. You don't know their diagnosis, you don't know their medications, you don't know, you don't know anything about them. And so through the CMOC, we were able to take them right from Ellington, get them onto ambulances, which had come from across the nation. We had ambulances from 48 states, and, and get them maybe to some place in Waco, maybe to some place in Cleveland, maybe some place, you know, in San Angelo. But they only had to make that move one time because the other thing is this is incredibly difficult on the patients, right? I mean, can you imagine being a nursing home patient in a flooded nursing home in New Orleans? Then you find yourself somehow you get onto a C-130, which if you've ever been on a C-130 is not a comfortable ride. You land, you Lord knows where you are now, and then you get put in an ambulance and, you know, I mean, just the emotional stress on these folks. So we, the last thing we want to do is have them bouncing around and, and, and not have a plan and not be able to execute the plan. So to answer your question, the, um, uh, and the other thing that happened then through our, our conversations was is when, when all these folks were coming in from East Texas, I made a call to, uh, to Dan Walterman, who's the CEO of the Memorial Herman System. And I said, Dan, I need a hospital. This is what's going on, I need a hospital. He said, give me 10 minutes, I'll call you back. So I know in that 10 minutes he was calling board members. And then 10 minutes later he called me back and he said, you got Memorial Herman Southeast, which is completely empty. Right. There's not a soul there. He says, I got one administrator, I got a half a dozen doctors, and I think we may be able to get about 10 nurses over there within the next couple of hours. Um, you know, and, and we started moving. Well, as it turned out, we were able, and he said, just don't overwhelm us, because I, I haven't got the, I'll give you the building, I'm gonna give you the keys. In fact, you can land helicopters in the front parking lot, because there's no cars there. And, um, and that's in fact what we did. But most of the folks that came off of those helicopters, we were actually, they were nursing home folks, which were able to actually get into nursing homes, which is where they belong. <coughs> so the flip side of all this long conversation is that there is a thing which is called the, the Catastrophic Medical Operations Center. There's now two in Texas. One is here in Houston. There's, the other one is in San Antonio. Between the two of them, we cover everything in the entire state. And, um, 
Um, and they now have them in, in New York and in Los Angeles and in a couple of other big cities. They've, they've looked at what we did and they're trying to replicate them. But the, the, the key thing to want to harp on something again is that A, you can't make up the problems that you're going to be faced with and B, you have got to solve them. Let me just say, yeah. could I say, the uh, FEMA then went to school on what we did. Dur during the thing, I I'd convene, we'd have periodic conference calls with the, all the other mayors in, in Texas. And so they would ask how we were handling certain issues, and we'd go over that with them. Uh, and uh, their city managers, often it was, on the, on the line. And then they changed the federal laws uh, for FEMA after uh, Katrina because the housing program that we set up was technically not authorized by federal law. So. Uh, and we wanted federal reimbursement. They wound up reimbursing us, but they they put in extra law. Congress had to pass it to allow FEMA to do what Houston did in the future. May I add something? Um, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah you're good. You're oh, good. good. Um, I just want to. It it's it makes me marvel to think about all this planning that you all did um, when I was doing research for the 1900 storm in Galveston, there was absolutely no planning at that time period. It, it never crossed their minds that there could be this kind of hurricane that would hit. So the city manager, uh, city um, mayor, the Galveston leaders had absolutely no plan in place. And um, the only warning that they had um, came from Cuba and then Florida. So they, the, the Weather Bureau raised warning flags on the strand outside of their buildings and that was all they had to go on and it's remarkable to think about how far we have come um, to go from nothing and after the 1900 storm Houston knew something terrible had happened in Galveston and the first thing that they did they loaded barges of um, barges of sh ships with um, barrels of fresh water they knew that was the number one thing that had to be taken care of and they um, shipped them immediately to Galveston. Of course, Houston had been hammered pretty hard in the storm as well. And um, they had to have in the front of these barges, men at the front of the, the ship, I'm, my dad was in the Navy, he would know what that was called, that the front of the ship. But they had to have people with long poles to push the bodies aside so they could get to Galveston. But Houston responded in an unbelievable way immediately after that storm bringing um, water and then on the return boats they were taking women and children off of the island because they were so sure of disease uh, would immediately uh, break out and then Houston somehow filled up barrels with lime and then the people in Galveston were putting lime down in the streets as their way of trying to handle so how far we have come my gosh it's remarkable I hope everyone here has enjoyed this as much as I have, and I think we all should give our panelists a, a thank you of any kind.